Welcome to Menopause Talks brought to you by Let's Talk Menopause. Let's Talk Menopause is a national nonprofit organization changing the conversation around menopause so women get the information they need and the health care that they deserve. So we're going to get started. We know more people will join, but we are so excited to have you here today. Um, as I said, Let's Talk Menopause is a national nonprofit organization changing the conversation around menopause so women and their families get the information they need and the health care they deserve. We have, this is our probably 13th or 14th menopause talk. You can go to our website at letstalkmenopause.org backslash talks for all of our prior talks. And um, I just wanted to, um, let's see. Um, we have a couple of housekeeping items. We've disabled the chat. So if you have any questions, you can ask them in the Q and A and we will answer as many questions as we can today. We also have, some information and links that we will send to you in the chat. There will also be a brief survey at the end of the webinar um, that we hope you complete. Um, that helps us bring you more content that you want. We are thrilled um, to have Dr. Layla Agarwal and Dr. Bahala Harvey join us today to discuss breast cancer and menopause. Um, and I also first just wanna introduce myself. I'm Donna Klassen. I am the CEO and co-founder of Let's Talk Menopause. Um, and just a note about these talks is, is that menopause talks are intended for informational purposes only, not as a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. So always make sure you see your individual healthcare provider. That being said, um, as I said, we're thrilled to have these two experts. Dr. Layla Agrawal is a medical oncologist specializing in breast cancer at Norton Institute in Louisville, Kentucky. She also runs a sexual health clinic for women with cancer and is involved in research and clinical trials. She was drawn to medicine at a young age, inspired by her mother who survived breast cancer. She also knew early on that she would specialize in oncology. Dr. Agrawal, Agrawal strives to get to know every patient and learn what is important in their lives to improve their experience navigating breast care and beyond. <clears throat> Dr. Deepa Hala Harvey specializes in breast surgery at Ohio Health Phys Physician Group in Columbus, Ohio. After being a breast cancer surgeon for eight months, she faced her own breast cancer diagnosis in March of 2015. This gives her unique insight in what, into what it is like to face cancer. She lost her breast cancer podcast to help educate others about body awareness and managing a breast cancer diagnosis. <clears throat> She pays great attention to helping her breast cancer patients live a good quality of life and find the new normal. If only we could replicate Dr. Agarwal and Dr. Hella Harvey thousands of times over, we would. Um, but now we have them here and I will turn it over to Dr. Hella Harvey. Thank you so much, Donna, for that wonderful introduction. Thank you for having us both on Menopause Talks today. And I just wanted to first ask uh, if you can just describe what happened to you first. Yes, so we're going right back to me, um, which I don't know, we don't always do. Um, but I think many of you, some of you know that I had my own experience with breast cancer like um, Dr. Hella Harvey. Um, in 2019, I was diagnosed with hormone positive breast cancer. And I decided to have, a, <clears throat> excuse me, a double mastectomy due to many suspicious areas in both breasts. <clears throat> At the time I was in late stage perimenopause. <clears throat> excuse me for one second. So I was already in late stage perimenopause. I was already having lots of symptoms, joint pain and irritability really being the top two. So when I was diagnosed, I decided to have the double mastectomy. Um, and during those tests, the testing for that, two large ovarian cysts were found, one with an internal suspicious mass. And so it was recommended to me to have my ovaries out. Um, fortunately, the masses were benign. Um, but it was also a treatment for the breast cancer um, to get my ovaries out. So I then had an oophorectomy, which is when you have both ovaries removed. Um, and so I went into surgical menopause. I started having about 20 plus, I didn't really count because there were so many, hot flashes a day, difficulty sleeping. Um, but then the other treatment, as many breast cancer survivors on here know, um, is to go on an aromatase inhibitor. So I started on anastrozole in October, so about a month or two after my surgeries. 
Um, and as many of you know, that blocks any estrogen in your body. Um, so then my symptoms really increased. Um, and I am a reproductive psychi uh, not psychiatrist, I'm a reproductive therapist. Um, and I was at the time running a partial hospitalization program for pregnant and postpartum women. So I had a really intense job and I was really not myself. And I think everyone that I worked with saw that I really, once I started on the international all really started to decline. I have no prior mental health history. Um, and I, my symptoms included brain fog, forgetfulness, extreme fatigue, hunger, um, which is one of the most difficult symptoms that I found to have because I, I never felt um, like I was full. Um, I felt really overwhelmed, exhausted, and irritable. Um, I started crying um, when I was running meetings, um, which was, again, not like me at all. Um, I was having multiple hot flashes, um, sweating, and I'm not a sweater um, ever. And so I started sweating profusely. Um, difficulty sleeping, waking up almost every hour, um, even though I was exhausted and I had no history of difficulty sleeping. Um, and soon after, I also started having um, very um, uh, pain with intercourse once I started having intercourse um, and vaginal dryness and leaking. Um, so the, that's really what happened. Luckily, um, well, I ended up leaving full-time work um, and returning to my private practice. Uh, but luckily I worked with great reproductive psychiatrists. Um, they set me up with a psychiatrist who is a cancer specialist. Um, and I also started seeing a therapist. I went on Pristique, which is an antidepressant um, and it treated my moon lability. Um, irritability, and it also helped with hot flashes. And I also went on gabapentin, um, which both of those medications I'm still on today. Um, I ended up doing a lot of physical therapy for um, some of the joint pain and the, the frozen shoulder and other things that I had. And now I do Pilates two to three times a week. And I generally feel good. I always say generally because no one feels good every second of every day. So that's my story. Wow. That's very uh, enlightening to hear, like you from from your perspective on from the diagnosis through treatment, and now you know we say finding your new normal after everything is said and done, because you never go back to your old normal. Unfortunately, this diagnosis really changes our lives forever, right? So, thank you so much for sharing your story, um, Dr. Agrawal. Do you see patients like Donna in your practice? Yeah. So Donna, thank you so much for sharing that story. And I think that what you went through will really resonate with a lot of people who've been diagnosed with breast cancer and maybe whether it was estrogen receptor positive or not may have experienced very similar and very profound menopausal symptoms going through the treatment. So, you know, it can be really impactful and it can, you know, come on really quickly, especially with the surgical menopause. So I'll talk a little bit about, you know, breast cancer and how some of the treatments for breast cancer can impact menopausal symptoms. So first of all, you know, there's different types of breast cancer. Some of them have estrogen receptor positive, meaning that treatments that impact hormones are effective treatment options for that kind of cancer. And so sometimes, uh, women who are diagnosed with an estrogen receptor positive breast cancer will be offered treatments with um, endocrine therapy, including tamoxifen or aromatase inhibitors, which include letrozole, anastrozole, or exemestane. And these work in different ways. So tamoxifen is an estrogen receptor modulator. That means it can sort of um, sort of turn the volume down or silence the estrogen receptor in the breast cancer cells, and that way it fights against the breast cancer. And this is an effective treatment for women who are premenopausal, perimenopausal, and postmenopausal. So it sort of works across the spectrum. Um, and for premenopausal women, tamoxifen doesn't cause menopause, but it may cause the body to feel some of the symptoms of menopause. Um, and similarly, women who are treated with an aromatase inhibitor, that is done after menopause. And so either a woman has already gone through natural menopause and is postmenopausal, or sometimes when women are premenopausal in certain circumstances, we recommend um, additional treatment to either 
silence or, or calm the ovaries or to surgically, surgically remove them as in Donna's case. And that converts someone almost instantaneously from being premenopausal to postmenopausal. And this is sometimes done through injections or shots that are given either monthly or every three months. And that's a medical menopause, or it can be done through surgical removal of the ovaries, like what Donna went through and that's surgical menopause. But either way, the ovaries stop making estrogen or the ovaries are removed and that induces menopause. And then the aromatase inhibitors, they block the step of a precursor to estrogen being converted into estrogen and thereby lower the circulating levels of estrogen in both people who are having um, menopause induced and those who have gone through natural menopause. And that can exacerbate or worsen the symptoms that might already be going on. So Donna mentioned a lot of these uh, symptoms, menopausal symptoms that we see that can be the result of cancer treatment. So hot flashes, uh, night sweat. Sometimes people feel it as temperature dysregulation, like always hot, always cold. Sweating, um, joint aches are common. Mood changes are really common. And Donna spoke to that, how she noticed the, you know, tearfulness and the emotional changes. And that's related to these menopausal symptoms. Sometimes people have difficulty sleeping. Sometimes people have, um, you know, sexual health changes as well, which we'll get into in a lot more detail. But, you know, all of these symptoms and uh, can be related to the breast cancer treatments. That's really great insight, uh, Dr. Agrawal. What, any other things as a treatment of breast cancer that can also cause menopausal symptoms? Yeah, so for people who don't ha necessarily have estrogen receptor positive breast cancer, perhaps a triple negative or a estrogen receptor negative HER2 positive, if somebody is premenopausal and goes through chemotherapy, sometimes that can cause menopause. So the chemo can give a big hit to the ovaries and sometimes that induces a premature menopause. And so as women come out of the chemotherapy, they might start to notice all of these symptoms, the same exact symptoms, hot flashes, joint aches, you know, periods may stop. And for some, it's a temporary menopause, meaning they may not have, um, they may have menopausal symptoms or they may not have a period for a period of time. And then even a couple of years later, it can either recover or it may not recover. And, you know, it has gone through menopausal transition a little earlier because of the chemo. So Donna was very kind to share her story and uh, the different side effects she had from, you know, going into surgical menopause, such as mood disorder, sleep, and, you know, vaginal dryness, so on and so forth. Do you agree with some of the treatments that she received? So there's absolutely there. So there's definitely uh, non-hormonal methods to treat the menopausal symptoms. And many of these are very effective in calming down the level of the symptoms and making people feel much more comfortable. And so some of them that I commonly prescribe to my patients would be antidepressants. So antidepressants can help with multiple symptoms of menopause that are caused either by premature menopause or the treatments like the tamoxifen and the aromatase inhibitors. And some of these like uh, the venlafaxine or um, the Pristique that Donna mentioned, these can be effective at treating multiple symptoms. So they can treat hot flashes, joint pain, and improve the mood. So depending on what a particular patient is experiencing, we can sort of tailor which of the medications can be helpful. Another one that I sometimes use is gabapentin that uh, Donna mentioned as well. And that is actually a medication that's typically given for neuropathy or nerve pain. And one of the other effects of it is it can help reduce hot flashes as well. For some people, a higher dose, so um, of up to 900 milligrams is needed to uh, settle down hot flashes. But in my experience, many of my patients feel relief with even lower doses than that. So for example, if somebody had uh, residual neuropathy from chemotherapy and had hot flashes um, or had trouble sleeping, sometimes gabapentin can be a useful one there. And then there's other medicines too. There's one called oxybutynin, which is really, I think of it sort of like an old fashioned bladder medication. But um, over time, we've learned that it's actually can be very effective in relieving hot flashes and sweats. So that's another, you know, option there too. And then many patients are interested in non, um, 
medicine, like they don't want to take another pill or have another medicine prescribed. And there are actually other things that, that may help. So the data for some of these is a little bit mixed, but sometimes I suggest that my patients try acupuncture to see if that can relieve the symptoms of menopause. It can also help with anxiety, joint pain, sleep for some people. Um, and then nutrition. So what people eat can be very closely tied to the incidence of hot flashes too. And some people notice that if they eat foods that have higher sugar or caffeine or alcohol, that hot flashes are worse. So, you know, I do talk about how uh, nutrition impacts uh, hot flashes and just have people sort of connect the dots a little bit. Are there certain foods that seem to trigger or worsen hot flashes? And then are there changes that can be made nutritionally that can maybe relieve symptoms overall? Yeah, uh, that's really good, valuable information. Thank you so much, Dr. Agarwal. Um, as a breast surgeon, I see a lot of patients who come in with these symptoms and uh, you know, unfortunately, so I, we operate on them, then they go see medical oncologists, then we don't see them for a couple of months. So they have had these symptoms. Sometimes they will say that they're having symptoms. So the things that my patients have said to me in terms of the side effects of from like chemotherapy or medical or surgical menopause is, you know, about their sexuality and their quality of life as a mm -hmm. result of the treatments. And I'm a big proponent of quality of life and helping women live the best that they can as a cancer survivor. I myself was premenopausal and I'm still premenopausal. And I took a tamoxifen uh, for, you know, for several, several years. And I did have, you know, hot flashes, night sweats. Um, I had genital urinary syndrome, but feeling like I needed to urinate all the time um, and thought that I had infections. I had to, you know, take antibiotics several times. Then, it, you know, figured it out that there's estrogen receptors in your bladder and can cause spasms. And honestly, as a breast surgeon, I didn't know that, you know, I'm embarrassed to say that, but Having gone through it personally, that was extremely painful. It did impact quality of my life a lot, you know, with work and everything. But patients have said to me, like, um, I'm thankful to be alive, but I'm dead down there. You know, um, cancer treatment has contributed to a deterioration of my excellent marriage is, is another quote that patients said to me. Uh, they never told me I would feel like this. Um, how could disease in one part of my body affect another part of my body? These are some of the comments from my, some of my patients. And there's many aspects of uh, problems that can happen in terms of quality of life. So obviously pain with intercourse, you know, vaginal atrophy, dryness, um, inability to resume penetration, and not having desire or arousal, these changes are extremely distressing to patients. So what are some things that you tell your patients when they come in with these uh, sort of questions and problems? Yeah, so I mean, everything that you said is so important. And, and you know, I wish that every breast every person diagnosed with breast cancer would know this information. So um, basically, you know, going through any cancer diagnosis and treatment can majorly impact people's sexual health. And so the way that I think about it is sexuality is seen in um, a bio, so meaning biological factors, psychological factors, and then social interpersonal factors. And when someone's diagnosed with cancer, it affects all of those areas. And so on the physical side or the biological side, there are changes to the body. And this includes, you know, maybe removal of the breast, maybe removal of the nipples, maybe loss of sensation of the nipple, which is a part of arousal and orgasm, an important part for many people. The symptoms on, you know, the, the term we use now that you mentioned is called the genitourinary syndrome of menopause, which means that the genital tissue relies on estrogen for moisture and for function. And it's far more, um, impactful than just dryness. I mean, dryness sounds like maybe that's not such a big deal, but it is a big deal because it affects the thickness of the tissue, the elasticity. The vagina has all these rugal folds that allows its elasticity and those can thin out. Women can actually develop narrowing or shortening of the vagina. Um, it reduces blood flow coming into the vagina that reduces lubrication. It affects the pelvic floor muscles as well. And as you, you know, mentioned, it affects the bladder, bladder function, predisposing to urinary tract infections, feeling like you might have a urinary tract infection, even if there's not a bacteria there. 
So all of those things are involved and more um, when it comes to the biological effects of cancer. And then psychologically, there are so many ways that going through a cancer diagnosis and treatment can impact things. So, you know, certainly there's concerns about mood, depression, anxiety, fear of cancer recurrence. And then when it comes to sexuality, the sexual response like libido, arousal, orgasm, those can all be affected both by, you know, mental emotional factors and by physical factors. So it's really a combination of everything. And then relationships shift too. And, you know, cancer is a really big thing that happens not only to an individual, but to a partnership, to a family, to a community. And so um, the way that that is processed and communicated and, you know, all of those changes are really um, impactful as well. So, you know, I really try to um, explain that the changes and the impact to sexuality, it goes far beyond just vaginal dryness or lubrication or things like that. And so I think it's really important to consider all of these different factors. What is a person going through? Um, what can be done to help each of these areas? Yeah, no, those are really great. So what are some things that you recommend? And we can start with one thing at a time. So mm -hmm. dryness. So someone who is hormone receptor positive breast cancer, meaning they are estrogen progesterone receptor positive breast cancer and they have vaginal dryness. What are some, or even triple negative breast cancer, I guess it really doesn't matter. What are some things that you recommend for these patients? So vaginal dryness um, is a very common symptom. And I think it's really important to be aware of this and to start using vaginal moisturizers up front, especially for um, estrogen receptor positive uh, disease where people might be on additional treatments that are blocking or lowering hormones. So a non-hormonal over-the-counter treatment that's, you know, widely available, you know, online at the drugstore is a Volvo vaginal moisturizer. And so there's different forms of that. I think it's really important that the correct products are selected so that there's not irritants or additives that can actually make matters worse. So I'll name some of the brands that I commonly recommend. So there is one brand that is called Good Clean Love. And here's a sample of um, that I hand out in my clinic. And they have a line of different products, including vaginal moisturizers. So a moisturizer is not meant to be used as a lubricant. It is actually for the health of the tissue. And it needs to be used at least three times a week, if not five times a week, forever, you know, and it's because that tissue is not producing its own moisture. So that has to be replaced with a product. So sometimes I hear patients say, oh yeah, I tried it once. It didn't really help. So I stopped using it. Consistent, regular, ongoing use of vaginal moisturizers is crucial, you know, and, and some people like to use a natural oil product like coconut oil, and that is fine. Um, everybody should really talk to their own doctors because there's some situations where that might not be the best option. Um, and then another additive into some of these products is a is a component called hyaluronic acid. And hyaluronic acid, you can find it in face creams and cosmetic products too, but it is a moisturizing component. And some brands have added hyaluronic acid to the vaginal moisturizer. And this has actually been evaluated in clinical studies and really can help relieve the symptoms of the genitourinary syndrome of menopause. And so some of the brands that I recommend, again, Good Clean Love has a vaginal moisturizer with hyaluronic acid. Another brand that um, I keep in the office too is called Hyalogyne. And this is nice because the products come in a sort of a gel with a applicator if people like that, or it also comes as like a little suppository that can just be inserted into the vagina. So based on people's preference, comfort level, what they you know want to use, there's lots of options there. Another good one is called Reverie, and that is a suppository and has hyaluronic acid in it too. So I would really, you know, stress and and emphasize the importance of using a vaginal moisturizer, especially one that has hyaluronic acid on a regular basis, at least three times a week, up to five times a week. So that really can, can relieve symptoms for many people as a non-hormonal method. So moisturizers, and I usually tell patients about similar, same products. Mm -hmm. 
And I usually say moisturizers for maintenance and you yeah. know, and slow low making just to kind of remember, like you have to just like we use hyaluronic acid on our face, you want to uh-huh. keep on a regular basis. So thank you so much for those recommendations. Uh, what lubricants would you recommend? Yeah. So lubricants also, um, actually there's specific, uh, guidelines from the world health organization about lubricants in terms of the proper osmolality and the pH. So it is actually really important to select the right one, because I will say the majority of lubricants on the market do not meet those criteria. So I pick a couple that are as close, you know, to those criteria. So good, clean love again, makes a lubricant, a water-based lubricant. And then here's another brand that's just like really great. It's called Ah, yes. And um, this one is a water-based lubricant. Uh, So water-based lubricants are a good place to start. They don't stain. They tend to not be irritating, easy to use, more widely available. But the downside is for people who have a lot of dryness, they may not last that long. So the downside to a water-based lubricant is it may not be as long lasting and it may not be slippery enough. So for people who have concerns about that, I suggest they move to a silicone-based lubricant. So silicone-based lubricants, and the brand I recommend for that is called Uber Lube. Um, And that is something that is more slippery and longer lasting. It might stain though. So just to be aware of that. And then the silicone lubricant cannot be mixed with any kind of a device or toy that has a silicone cover. So you can't mix silicone and silicone. Um, And so, you know, it may be useful to have both around just depending on what sort of activities are going to be done. Yeah. No, that's really great advice. I, I'll ask you a very important question that I pretty much <laughs> ask at least once or twice a week. And that is, I have a hormone receptor positive breast cancer. Could mm-hmm. I use a vaginal estrogen? And what are your thoughts? And, you know, someone like myself, you know, who's taking amoxifen or someone who's taking a rheumatase inhibitor, is it safe to use a vaginal estrogen? Yeah. So that's a really important question. And I think it's important to ask, you know, your, your healthcare professionals about it and to talk about it. So basically this question has been, has been answered by multiple large medical societies, including ASCO, which is the cancer society, ACOG, which is the gynecology society, NAMS, which is the menopause society and ISHWISH, which is an international women's sexual health society. And all of them say essentially the same thing, which is for people who have a hormone hormone sensitive breast cancer, start with non-hormonal methods like the moisturizers and the lubricants that we just talked about. If those don't control symptoms, then yes, discuss vaginal estrogen, you know, risks and benefits with, with the doctor. And so what are the benefits? I mean, the benefits are the reason that there is vaginal dryness and genital urinary syndrome is the lack of estrogen. So it can help, you know, the tissue, it improves comfort, it reduces pain with sex, it can reduce urinary tract infections. Um, So all of that is the benefit. The risk is really, in my opinion, more theoretical, because the question is, does a tiny itty bitty amount of that estrogen get absorbed into the bloodstream? And what impact does that have on cancer recurrence? And so there have been studies in people who don't have breast cancer looking at the blood levels of low and ultra dose, ultra low dose preparations of vaginal estrogen. And what they find is that in the short term, there's a minuscule blip, which then kind of resolves and goes down. So I think those studies using modern low dose and ultra low dose topical vaginal estrogen preparations have minimal systemic absorption. There's a couple older studies, um, smaller and older studies that looked at, you know, people who are on endocrine therapy and they take vaginal estrogen, is there a higher risk of recurrence? And um, small studies done previously showed no real increased risk of recurrence. There was a newer study that was reported last year Um, which was a Danish observational study. And this looked at women who um, had breast cancer and who might've been on no endocrine therapy or on tamoxifen or on an aromatase inhibitor and looked at people who used vaginal estrogen and ones who didn't. So this was not a randomized controlled trial. They just looked back in time to see what had happened. And in that study, they found that overall, in the whole group of patients, the ones who used vaginal estrogen did not have a higher risk of cancer recurrence or mortality, which is death, 
But in the subgroup of the patients who were using aromatase inhibitors and used vaginal estrogen, they found a higher risk of recurrence, but not death. Now, there were some major problems with this study, which really question it's whether it's applicable to patients that we treat today. One of those is that they didn't report certain things that we know now are vital to treating breast cancer, like the HER2 status. None of these patients got chemotherapy. Their patterns of treating with endocrine therapy were very different than what we do today. And also the doses of vaginal estrogen were much higher. So while I think it's, you know, good to have that information. I don't think it's um, a reason to avoid vaginal estrogen in a woman who is on an aromatase inhibitor, who is having symptoms of um, dryness, pain, urinary tract infection. So in my practice, I do prescribe vaginal estrogen commonly to patients who are on aromatase inhibitors. How about along the same lines? How about vaginal testosterone? So, you know, vaginal testosterone is not something that I really prescribe much. So for um, the vaginal, the genital urinary syndrome of menopause, I think the estrogen is, is the preferred agent for me. There is another um, formulation of vaginal hormone, which is called DHEA, and that's sort of a, a precursor that gets converted to estrogen in the tissue. And that's also available and included kind of under the the guidelines of discussing risks and benefits of hormones with your medical professional. You know, I have patients who come in and say, uh, I have pain at the introitus at the opening of the mm -hmm. vaginal penetration. And do you think the, the moisturizers, the lubricants, or even the estrogen would help with that? Or is there any other specific medications that you would Yeah. Do. So that's a great question. So that is a very, you know, specific and particular symptom that some patients have, and it's different than just general dryness and it's different than pelvic floor dysfunction. So a person who has this says pretty much exactly what you said, that there is pain with the initial point of penetration. So medically we call that the introitus, which is sort of like the opening of the vagina. And there was actually a clinical trial that looked at patients who had this and to apply topical lidocaine just to that opening for a couple minutes and then wipe it off and then found that the pain symptom was dramatically reduced. And so I do uh, recommend and prescribe a topical lidocaine preparation for patients who have this particular symptom. So the medical term for this is insertional dyspareunia, which basically means pain at the initial time of penetration. So that can be a very helpful um, management strategy for this symptom. Is that, that, does that go with the genital urinary syndrome of menopause? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I yeah, had I think it well, unfortunately, but you know, I did, again, I didn't know that you could use lidocaine. So thank you so much for educating <laughs> me. And, uh, you know, so I definitely see patients in follow-up, but, you know, I think our focus is more on following them in after surgery, how the decisions are healing, any complications, you know, the sensation and so on and so forth. So um, your patients are very lucky to have you. <laughs> One other, a uh, couple of other things that I wanted to spend some time on is pelvic floor dysfunction. And um, and how do patients present to your practice about the pelvic floor dysfunction problems? What are the most common complaints that they have? Yeah, so that's a really important one. And one that I wish there was greater awareness about pelvic floor dysfunction. So the pelvic floor is a set of muscles that kind of work together to help support the organs of the pelvis, including the bladder, the vagina, the rectum. And they've got to work together. They've got to be strong, but they also have to be able to relax when they need to, like to pee, to have a bowel movement, or to allow for vaginal penetration. And what can happen is a variety, a number of different conditions can contribute to something called pelvic floor dysfunction. And sometimes we think of this as, you know, maybe some weakness in the pelvic floor that contribute to organ prolapse, for example. But what I see way more commonly in my practice is that the pelvic floor muscles might be hyperactive or overly contracted, and that can result in a symptom of pain with attempted penetration. And many things that uh, people diagnosed with breast cancer go through can contribute to that, like the hormonal changes, stress, you know, um, mood changes, surgeries, all these different changes to your body can contribute. And so sometimes what people will say is that it's not dry. I don't have decreased lubrication, but I have pain. I have 
severe pain inside with attempted penetration. And some women even use the phrase, like, it feels like it's hitting a wall, or it feels like something's blocking it or a brick wall and a sharp pain. And so to me, any of those symptoms are kind of like a red flag for, okay, you need to get a pelvic exam to see what's going on. It's important to diagnose this because there's other things that could cause similar symptoms. And then if that's the case, get to a pelvic floor physical therapist. So just like there's physical therapists that can work on, you know, other muscles in our body, there are specialized physical therapists that can work on the pelvic floor. And they do a variety of different things, including external exercises like the back and the hips, as well as internal inside the vagina um, exam and a certain like techniques that can release those muscles. And then they can teach women how to do those techniques themselves, um, sometimes using uh, wands or like little massagers almost internally, and then other times using a tool called a vaginal dilator. So a vaginal dilator um, is like a little cylinder and it can come in different sizes, starting from the smallest might be about the size of my pinky finger and then moving up in both caliber and length. And so if a woman is having either pain with penetration because of vaginal narrowing and loss of elasticity, or if it's the pelvic floor contributing as well, these can be used to help gradually over time um, improve the stretch or improve the tolerance to, uh, to penetration. And so Working with a pelvic floor therapist can be extremely helpful. Using vaginal dilators can also be extremely helpful. Have you ever used or referred a patient for um, the vaginal lasers? Yeah, so, so vaginal laser therapy is something that's been out there. It's been advertised in different ways. Unfortunately, the data behind it is not supportive of it as a good option for, especially for women who have breast cancer, who have severe genital urinary syndrome of menopause. And this was recently, you know, published and reviewed and is something that I would actually recommend against. Oh, you would recommend against mm -hmm. vaginal lasers. Okay. Okay. Um, I do like that you said, you know, physical therapy for pelvic floor dysfunction. You know, I think we, if we hurt our back or leg or whatever, we are quick to go to see a physical therapist, but sometimes not as quick to go when, you know, there's pelvic floor dysfunction. And like you said, it's a sling of muscles. It, you know, uh, there's dysfunction, you take care of it. And so that's really great information on the dilators. And also good to know that the uh, vaginal lasers are not as uh, st well studied or, you know, and mm -hmm. don't have as um, good uh, success rate. How about desire? I mean, desire is such a difficult thing for women. And, you know, women will come to me and say, gosh, I have no desire, you know, and uh, what do you, what do you say to that woman who says I have no desire since I've been diagnosed with breast cancer? There's so many aspects to it. There's body yeah. and they have scars. They just had surgery and plus not even accounting for the complications from chemo surgery and radiation, other things. How do you counsel someone who has loss of desire for sex? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's a really big deal. So I see that really commonly, and it can be one of the most distressing impacts of going through all this. So when somebody has low desire, the, the next question I ask is, is that distressing to you? Because some women couldn't care less if they never have sex again, and they're totally fine with it. And so is their partner. And that's, there's no problem with that. So the, the real question is, is the low desire distressing, you know, and other people feel like a big loss. Like this was an important part of my life and I, you know, feel a real distress over it. And that's when we start to talk about like interventions that can help. And so the, the first thing that I do is review the medication list because there's many medications that come about after a cancer diagnosis that can actually impact libido or desire. And so look through that and just make sure that there are all the best medications for that person. If an alternative would be better you know, consider that. And then the next thing I do is just talk about um, sort of what is desire. And so for women, it's really important to know that there's actually two types of desire. One is called spontaneous desire. So just that spontaneous drive to want to have sex. But the other is called responsive or reactive desire. And in that circumstance, actually 
something comes first, whether it's emotional intimacy, the desire for emotional and physical closeness, or whether it's actually physical or mental arousal comes first, and then comes the desire to have sex. So this whole paradigm that like you suddenly get spontaneous desire, then you get aroused and you have sex and have an orgasm. That's not really how it works. So to just educate people to say, even if the spontaneous desire level has gone down, you can still work with the responsive desire. So how do you make time and space for emotional connection? How do you make sure that you and your partner are still having affection and physical touch, even without uh, sexual activity? You know, how do you maintain those? And then how do you make time and space for intimacy? So make sure that you're picking the right time of day when your energy is good, not when you're exhausted, you know, after the kids go to bed at the end of the week. So, you know, how do you pick a time, plan ahead? You know, when people are first dating, they, you know, plan dates, they anticipate it, they prepare for it, they, you know, they look forward to it, Um, you know, so kind of plan ahead, set a time and space, uh, set your parameters for what you feel comfortable with, what you don't. If someone's having pain with penetration, just take that off the table, Um, you know, and, and so talk about these different behavioral changes. And then things that can help with, um, with, arousal will also then help with the reactive desire. So whatever a person thinks will help with their physical or mental arousal, sometimes that has to do with reading, I call them sexy stories, um, and they can be found on this great app on the cell phone called Rosie, Meet Rosie, has a lot of great medical information as well as a nice library of stories for geared for women um, that are very accessible and approachable. Um, So things that help with arousal. And so that's really step one. So I consider that kind of mindset shifts or just behavior modifications. After that, psychosocial counseling can be really helpful, especially as you mentioned, if body image concerns are there. Body image is a big deal. So um, sometimes when my patients talk to me about body image, they may almost feel embarrassed that they even care about that, but it is a big deal. It is how you feel in your body. It is how you think about your body and how you move through the world and how you act. And so it has nothing to do with vanity. It has nothing to do with, you know, caring about looking a certain way or not. It is, it is very closely connected to somebody's sense of self. And so when there are concerns of body image, I think it's really important that we ask about that and refer for psychosocial counseling, which can be really helpful in improving body image. And then the next step beyond that is actually meeting with a certified sex therapist. So within, you know, mental health professionals, just like physicians are specialized in different areas. There are mental health professionals that are specialized in sex therapy. And a great way to locate those people is through a website called ASECT that you can search by your location to find a certified sex therapist. And then that can be extremely helpful in working through a uh, you know, libido, desire, arousal, orgasm, and also working, you know, with the couple, with both people in the relationship, um, because it's not always just one person that's affected. You know, sometimes if there's a male partner and there's been pain with penetration, it's very common for me to hear, like, he's afraid to do it again because he hurt me and he doesn't want to. And so really there's issues on both sides. You know, sex is not a necessarily a one person situation. So looking at both partners and how that's affected them both is something that a sex therapist can do. And then beyond that, there's actually a couple medications that have been FDA approved to treat a condition called hypoactive sexual desire disorder in premenopausal women. So to be um, very clear, these are not FDA approved for women whose changes in libido have occurred as a result of a medical problem or a medication. Um, However, you know, there are ongoing studies looking at one, flibanserin, which is a pill taken at bedtime um, to see how effective this could be for women who have breast cancer, who are on aromatase inhibitors or endocrine therapy. And the preliminary single arm study on it that was reported um, showed, you know, 
promising benefit. It needs to be compared against a placebo because sometimes there's a strong placebo effect. Um, but research into this medication specifically for breast cancer survivors is ongoing. The other one is an injectable medication called bremelanotide, and it's um, given as an as needed. So prior to planned sexual activity, a woman would inject herself with this medication and then see an increase in desire. So, you know, there's a, there's a real spectrum of things that people can look at and look into and talk to their healthcare professionals about regarding libido and it can get better. Yeah, those are all such great advices and such great tips. I tell women, what was your sexual dialogue before cancer? You know, did it change with cancer? And, you know, they're always afraid that the partner or the partner is afraid that they may hurt, you know, our, our patients. And it's then that's why they may sometimes may not initiate sex. But like for us women, you know, our sexual organ is, you know, in between our ears, you know, for guys, it's a different place, right? So uh, we have we a lot of foreplay. And I say usually foreplay is all day long, you know, start in the kitchen, you know, not in the bedroom. And um, and I say, do you talk about it? Do you have an open communication? Women oftentimes, I feel like feels, he doesn't like me anymore. He doesn't find me attractive because now I have a scar or I don't look the same. But like 99.9% .9 of the time, that's not the case. Um, the significant other still loves them as much as they did before, if not more as a result of going through this journey together. I think uh, communication is like a great key to having a you know, good quality sex life and uh, good quality of life. And the strategies for pleasure may be different now than they were before. You know, you may, may not have a nipple, but there are different ways to, you know, make that arousal for yourself. But I think just knowing yourself is good. I think we suffer from body image as women. And I did a talk on body image. 75% of women have body image issues before breast cancer diagnosis. So just imagine what the cancer diagnosis and the scars do to the, you know, to the person. I always say scars are like, that's your battle signs, you know, be proud of it. You know, that makes you, you uniquely you. And um, I think something- Dr. Dr. Hellebari, I'm gonna cut you off for a second because our audience has questions. Oh, do they? Okay. And, and we love to answer them. I'm actually going to ask them um, and we're okay. going to move through really pretty quickly and answer either one of you can answer these. Um, but we just always want to make sure our, our answer, our questions are answered because mm -hmm. our audience wants to know. Um, and we're going to go back to mood. And I, I guess I will also just say what you were just saying before is I'm, I'm a skills-based therapist and I would recommend people go to a skills-based therapist. And by skills, I mean, CBT, DBT, acceptance-based therapy for body image, for all the things that we're talking about, including symptoms. So we're gonna go back to a mental health question. Um, and if you can answer them pretty quickly, cause we don't have a ton of time left. Um, so somebody asked, I was premenopausal and had estrogen positive breast cancer. As far as I could tell, tamoxifen gave me depression, lots of random crying. My oncologist swears that tamoxifen does not affect mood because it only affects breast cancer cell estrogen receptors. Can you talk about more, more about how this works and whether tamoxifen still might've affected my mood? Thank you. Yeah. So in, in, in my opinion, tamoxifen definitely has the potential to affect people's mood. And I include this in my counseling up front when I'm talking about risks and benefits. It doesn't affect it for everybody, but for some, it definitely can. And the mm -hmm. important thing there is that there are treatments that can be given to help counteract the mood changes, and those would be antidepressants. However, with tamoxifen, some antidepressants interact with the tamoxifen, and so they have to be selected carefully. So um, I think that, in my opinion, and yes, it can affect the mood for sure. And mm -hmm. treatment can be effective, but the selection of what medications is really important. Mm -hmm. I will also add to that as a therapist, um, no matter what, it sometimes find the reason why someone's feeling depressed doesn't always matter as much as the fact that you are, right? So sometimes a lot of people search for the why, 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 why is this happening to me? And I get that. But part of this is figuring out, okay, what can I do now? I'm feeling this way now and what can I do about it? And how can I get the help that, he, that I need? So I would also with the medication, I think along with that um, CBT therapy with a provider, that's good. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. And by the time somebody is on Tamoxin, they've also had the major life events of a cancer diagnosis, okay. a treatment, you know, many losses, perhaps many changes in their lives. So, you know, it, there are multiple factors that could contribute to that. And a hundred percent agree with you, Donna, on that. We're going to go back to sex. 
Um, so with um, somebody asked with insertional um, dyspareunia, um, I can never say that word, um, painful sex, um, want to confirm process with lidocaine. Apply lidocaine to introitus, wait four minutes, then wipe off. Wipe off to reduce the number of the numbing sensations elsewhere, including partner's penis, right? That's correct. That's how it was done in the clinical trial. I will note that for anyone having pain with penetration, they should see a medical professional and have a pelvic exam to make sure that the actual cause of that pain is diagnosed. Okay, great. Okay, somebody else asked, do you prescribe DHEA for women with low DHEA with ER positive, estrogen positive breast cancer? And two, can this help with low sex drive? So, um, the, so are you talking about topical DHEA, which is the prasterone or called intrarosa? So I tend to prescribe more actual, just vaginal estrogen is my preferred one, but others do prescribe topical DHEA. These are meant to act locally. So they act on the tissues of the, you know, genital area, um, and they don't have a systemic effect. So it could help if you were having pain and then the pain gets better. That make, might make you more interested in it, but in terms of actually helping libido, no. Okay. Great. Um, somebody else asked, um, I carry BRIP1 gene mutation and did uh, bilateral mastectomy, um, DCIS ER positive in December. I have an upcoming surgery for my nine centimeter cyst on my right ovary. My medical oncologist says no to hormone therapy if um, BSO is done. I don't know what BSO is, but I'm 41 years old and sudden deprivation of estrogen. And I think worried um, that they will have long-term impact on bone, heart, brain health. If BSO is done, can I take bioidentical HRT? May I know how to get it? Are all the symptoms and long-term effect on health can, can help by healthy eating and doing exercise? Thank you. Yeah. So, you know, clearly this is a really nuanced question and a very specific situation. So, you know, there's some circumstances that we actually do recommend hormone replacement therapy in women um, who have genetic mutations such as BRCA who undergo risk reducing um, removal of their ovaries at the age where they're premenopausal who do not have a history of breast cancer. So this particular case is a little different in that the person did have breast cancer um, I, I really think this comes down to a very nuanced discussion between the patient and multiple medical providers, including the oncologist and a menopausal specialist to understand all of the risks and benefits. So, I mean, you know, in my opinion, perhaps there's not an absolute answer to this, but just an understanding of what is known, what is not known, what are the risks one way, what are risks the other way what is the patient's priority, and to really have a very careful and nuanced discussion. So in, in addition to talking to the medical oncologist, incorporating the expertise of a menopause specialist would be useful as well. And people can find a menopause specialist by going to our website at letstalkmenopause.org, find a provider, and that links to the North American Menopause Society website where you can put your zip code in. Um, for sexual health, um, I believe that is switch. I think it's S I S S W S H. Is that right? That's correct. Um, they also have a list of providers and that's for sexual health. Um, so, you know, people don't know that there are specialists like urogynecologists and, um, other providers, um, that are specialists in this. So it's really important to find those. Um, so somebody asked the name of the injection for desire. Um, so so the, the generic name is called bremelanotide and the brand name is called Vilasi. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, another question. It sounds like managing sexual side effects requires a lot of love, patience, and good communication. Yes. That sounds more manageable if you're in a committed relationship. What if you're dating? So, okay. you know, honestly, in, in my own sexual health clinic, I see patients who are single, who don't who aren't dating, who don't have a particular partner in mind. And all of the things that we talked about are really equally relevant. So management of genitourinary syndrome of menopause, understanding arousal, desire, responsive, reactive, you know, all of body image, mood, you know, all of those things apply equally if somebody is single, dating, you know, married, um, across the entire range. So I would say everything still applies. I mean, the particular, you know, if you're dating, you still have a 
partner, you're still in a relationship, that communication is still important. Um, so I think all of those issues are really important. Okay. Um, so somebody just asked, um, I'm 52 postmenopausal and on tamoxifen HR positive. I don't seem to be able to have an orgasm. It just fizzles. Are there treatments for that? I will actually just ask, answer this really quickly too, is if you go to our website and go to past menopause talks, we had Dr. Lauren Stryker and Dr. Cheryl Kingsburg um, on a few of our um, menopause talks. And I think we did one specifically on orgasm. So you can also go back to that, but you guys can also answer if you want. Yeah. So, I mean, I think for the, for the orgasm, again, that's biopsychosocial. So there's biological changes, for example, you know, actually, is this person more apt to have a clitorally stimulated orgasm or a vaginally stimulated orgasm and what's going on biologically there? Um, and then mental is the big factor there. So working with a mental health professional or a sex therapist can actually help significantly with this issue. Um, and I'm sure that your other talk probably goes way more in depth than would be, would be a great resource there too. Um, somebody else just asked about finding a good psychiatrist and therapist, and I will say that that's a very um, long and short answer, <laughs> um, but I would say that finding a good psychiatrist, um, I, I would think that finding somebody who specializes in women's health and especially women's reproductive health, so we know that there are three windows of vulnerability for women, periods, the onset of the period, and PMDD and PMS, perinatal and menopause. And so a lot of those people who focus on perinatal psychiatry um, would, I think, be good for that. Any thoughts about that as well? And we only have a minute left, so. Yeah, sometimes cancer centers will partner yeah. with um, specialized mental health professionals um, that would be apt to do that. Mm -hmm. And then again, the ASECT for the sex therapy specialty. Mm -hmm. And I would also add with that, that yes, the sex therapist um, and maybe and or somebody with does CBT, because I do think the mm -hmm. pain then contributes to the lack of desire and then the thought, the negative thoughts about it. So that's another sort of, you know, way to mm -hmm. sort of look at it as well. Oh my gosh, we have to end. It's 12.58. Um, thank you so much to our panelists. This has been a really incredible menopause talk. And um, I hope our, our audience agrees. I'm sure that they do. Um, thank you to our panelists, Dr. Layla Agrawal and Dr. Deepa Hella Harvey.